Welcome to the Education, Career, and Beyond podcast. We've combined life experience with young adult drive and ambition. Are you just starting to college plan? Did you finish your education and wonder, now what? Join us in this lively discussion about the topics you need to know to create the next stage of your life's dreams, careers, finances, education, and more. Brought to you by Voice for Heroes 501c3. Welcome to another episode. Boy, are we going to have fun today. If you're just scrolling through, stop. Do not pass through. You want to listen to this. Watch this if you're watching this with us live, if you're consuming it later. But again, the Education, Career, and Beyond podcast. And we have a guest today, Richard Rosser, who is a filmmaker, author. He has worked on some pretty big name shows that we're going to discuss. I think you might have heard a few of them. And we're going to talk today also about his background, but chat GPT, big hot subject. I have a lot of questions regarding that. And we also have Ed Sanderson, our regular host. We love Ed. He is such an incredible part of this show. He brings such value and tremendous insight from his background working with young adults for so many years on to success. And our guest host today, the one and only Layla Naji. She is a high school senior in Dana Point, but she is also the Interact governor for all of Orange County, California, with the Rotary Clubs there that are in the Interact, specializing in our young adults. And this is going to be quite a collection of personalities. Welcome to the show, Richard and Layla. Welcome. Well, thank you very much. And Layla, I am I'm blown away. Here I am sharing uh, sharing this podcast with with the Interact Governor. That's very impressive, I have to say. <laughs> she, she makes the role sound so big, but yeah. I don't know. It still hasn't hit me yet. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Appreciate it. Richard, share with us your background as little as much as you want to share in a couple minutes. We'd love for our audience to really know more about you as we dive into picking your brain and putting you in the hot seat for the duration of this interview. The hot seat. Well, thanks, Amy. Well, I, I've worked in the TV and film business for 30 some odd years, and I am a storyteller. Uh, I learned from the best who was my father. He was an amazing raconteur, which for those of you who don't speak French, raconteur is storyteller. And uh, he loved to tell jokes, story jokes, not a, you know, not a classic sort of setup punchline, but story jokes that might take two or three minutes or four or five minutes. And they'd have all these crazy characters and voices and sound effects. And, and then they'd come up with sort of, sometimes the punchline was a groaner, but you'd have more fun listening to the actual story than you would just waiting for the punchline. So through the course of my life, I sat at the dinner table and parties and listened to my dad telling these kinds of stories. And then when I finished up high school, I went to college in Virginia to a small liberal arts college. They had one film course. It's very different from how it is now. Every single school has film programs, digital media programs. Back then, my college had one film course. So I made a few little live action movies, but I loved animation and especially claymation. And so I said to my professor, hey, I found this old Bolex 16 millimeter camera in a closet. Can I make an animated movie with this thing? And he said, I, I guess, I, I don't even know what you're talking about, but if you wanna do it, you're fine, go, go for it. I just can't help you out. So I made this three minute black and white animated movie on my own, I locked myself in this room with, a, with a, a chess table and some clay and made this movie. And then after I printed it, uh, he said, you know, this turned out pretty well. Why don't you submit this to some contests? So I did, and it ultimately ended up winning a Student Academy Award. So I was blown away. They flew, I, that was in Virginia. They flew me out to Hollywood for the awards. I stayed in Hollywood for five days for all the, you know, the celebration and everything. And so I won this award and I thought, well, if, if they think I have this talent, I should pursue this. So I went to college, at, I went to grad school at NYU and got in the TV and film business. And over the course of my career, I've worked on shows like Grey's Anatomy, Chicago Med, The MacGyver Reboot, uh, This Is Us, and 24. I don't know if any of you all have watched 24, but, mm -hmm. but it was an action thriller uh, in the early 2000s. And so... I've learned to be a storyteller both professionally, but then between shows or seasons, I've realized the importance and power of storytelling on an everyday basis. And at one point I was, uh, my, my daughter was getting her permit 
to drive and we were out driving and something happened that afternoon with the car. And, and uh, so that evening I said to her, Allie, tell the story of what happened today. And she said, oh yeah, mom. Oh, I almost ran over a cat. And I said, wait, wait, wait a second. That No, no, that's not the story of what happened. That's just, I mean, that's like the synopsis. I said, no, we were coming around a corner and there was this cat sitting in the middle of the road and Allie stomps on the brakes and runs not over the cat, but drove over the cat, right? And it appeared behind the car. It popped up and went and ran off into the brush to live another eight lives. And with that short telling of the story of the incident with the cat, my daughter went, oh, I get it now. You wanted me to tell the actual story. And I said, yeah, yes. that is much more fun than just saying, yeah, I almost hit a cat with a car. Right. Way more fun. And so so I, I took that and the fact that my dad was this amazing storyteller. And I sort of said to myself, man, there's a lot of people out there who really may not know how to tell a story. And so what I've done over the past few years is I've created curriculum and programs for students that teach them how to tell stories. And what we do is we start off with a simple story. Now, what what's the simplest kind of story you can imagine? Well, it's a joke. And not, again, not set up punchline, but a story joke. And some of them, you know, might be a paragraph long. So what we do is we work on the students coming up with a character and a fun voice and sound effects, and they present this joke story uh, during class. Now, don't tell anyone, but while they're doing this, they're actually speaking to an audience. They're public speaking, but we won't, we don't say that, right? So some of them realize, but some of them don't until they're done and they realize, oh my gosh, I just got up in front of a group of 20 or 25 people and performed. So we, we tell these stories in class and then the next session, I talk to them about a tall tale and how to embellish and how to, you know, Paul Bunyan with the blue ox and the huge ax able to, you know, take down a whole forest of trees in, in one swipe. And then we work on ghost stories or urban legends. And there's something, there's something about ghost stories and urban legends that everyone just loves. There's, there's a certain viralness about them that they just... Everyone loves to tell a ghost story or urban legend. Mm -hmm. So what we do is we, we, we practice our storytelling techniques with these fun stories. And then we take those techniques and work on a template for stories for life that students can use. For instance, if you're in a job interview, you can take a story and you can use that to show the interviewer that you're responsible, that you can communicate, that you can think on your feet. And then you can use a uh, story to pitch a project or ask for funding for a, for a nonprofit or whatever you're involved in. And story is the basic way that we communicate with, uh, with really everyone. So sorry, that, that went on a little bit long, but uh, that's, that's the long winded version of, uh, of where I'm coming from and, and what I do with story. It's powerful. You are speaking my language because I live in this space as well. And I'm like, yes, 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 yes. <laughs> yes, I know. I, I listened to I listened to the interview with you and uh, was blown away because there's so many similarities between your episode and uh, and what I'm what you know what I'm here to talk about today. I just love it. Well, and don't worry about the length because Ed's question will also be just as long. So okay. Be prepared to really soak that in before you be able to prepare that answer. <laughs> Uh, Richard, that. I'm in trouble every single episode, so there's nothing <laughs> new here. Uh, Layla, I sense that you want to ask, ask some questions, so I'm going to give you the floor as our guest host today. Yes. Well, honestly, he kind of answered some of my questions because I kind of wanted to hear more about his experience in the entertainment industry, especially um, with the awards and everything. But I think he kind of answered that for me. So, Ed, let me let me start thinking a little bit okay all right, all right yeah. richard buckle up buddy because i'm going to give you a 14 piece question and we're going <laughs> to well, well I, you're going to give me a 14 piece question but i'll answer it in 37 yeah there I you go this yeah. um I <laughs> so i i know you probably have tons and tons of stuff to talk about when you come to your career but I've got one question about that, and I'm sure the ladies will have other questions. And it is about storytelling. So you have Chicago Med uh, on your things that you've done. My wife and I like Chicago Fire, 
then mm-hmm. they've got Chicago PD, right? And I right. noticed that they've got these episodes that string all three shows together. And I'm really curious as a writing group, how you thread that needle. So there's continuity as you pass the baton to each different, uh, you know, uh, franchise to, to tell a complete story. You know, Ed, that's a fantastic uh, question or, or, you know, scenario. And for those of you who are, who are not really aware of the whole Chicago uh, uh, environment, what happened was they were doing, I'm trying to remember, I think Chicago Fire was first. And then it was such a, such a success that they had a couple of characters who were in the police department. And so I think either the first or second season, they decided to do a, a final episode of Chicago Fire, and it would potentially become a pilot for Chicago PD. Mm. And so they, they had these characters, and then they created this whole other world for Chicago PD, but the characters jumped back and forth between the seasons. And then I think it was season three of Chicago Fire, they did the Chicago Med, they did the same thing. Now, at one point, and you may not know this, Ed, but at one point, they did a Chicago uh, uh, attorney version, and, uh, and and they were and they were planning on. I think it went one season, and I guess four four Chicago shows was too much. Three's <laughs> perfect, four too much. But it's really interesting. Ed's question is: How do you thread the needle of these characters? And it's the answer is basically very carefully. And very thoughtfully, because what you end up with is you end up with fire and police and med, and you've got characters that can go back and forth between the different the different series and have interactions in those different series. And it's it's absolutely brilliant, brilliant uh, storytelling. You know, with the advent of of sort of binge and streaming TV. Uh, It used to be, you know, 15, 20 years ago that all the actors and all the really high profile creators wanted to be in movies. And I think really um, sort of since 24, 24 was one of the first shows that people were able to really binge watch. Now, take yourselves back, see, 23 years, right? So 2001, when we first shot the, uh, the first season of 24, there wasn't streaming. There, the internet was, I don't think we could really, you know, watch stuff over the internet. You know, it was mainly bulletin boards and email. And so the uh, the episodes of 24 would come out on DVD. And that was back when Blockbuster, anyone ever heard of Blockbuster? That was when Blockbuster was, <laughs> was like, what? <laughs> people would go in and they would rent a, a, a collection of like four DVDs. And that would have, I think, eight episodes. And so you could go home over the weekend and binge watch those eight episodes of 24, which for those of you who don't know, it was an hour long TV show and each hour of the show was an hour of the day in the one day of each season. And so 24 was one of the first shows that people really started binge watching. And the difference between a movie that lasts an hour and a half to two, well, some of you last three hours, if you want to, you know, if you're, if you're looking at a James Cameron movie, but, um, but most movies last an hour and a half to two hours. You can accomplish only so much in that time. Whereas a TV show that runs, I mean, Breaking Bad went, what, seven seasons? You can really explore character and stories. And sure, if you, you know, if you run out of material, you run out of material, you, you shut the thing down. But for really, really inventive and creative creators, they come up with shows that just go and go and they come up with some crazy, crazy stuff. And so for me, TV is really where it's at and streaming uh, because you can really, really dive into those characters and figure that out. And Dick Wolf, who is the producer creator of the Chicago world and series, has done that sort of times three. He's taken three series and combined them. So now you have these characters overlapping and guest starring in the other in the other series uh, and it's so it's just brilliant. It really, it really plays into this new type of storytelling, which is very meta. If you want to, if you want to, you know, use a use a very technical term. Gotcha. Um, different question for you, Richard. Uh, we work with a lot of young people like Layla who are getting ready to go to college, and part of that mm-hmm. process is writing for admissions. 
And what I have found in the time I've worked with these young people, they struggle to write their own story. Like if you want them to write something uh, about the Civil War or do some research on a scientific project, they can handle that like a pro. When they sit down to write, sometimes they struggle because no one's asked them to write about themselves. Yep. What advice do you have for a young writer who's been tasked with writing about themselves and telling a story about themselves? What's the process that you would give them to walk through that so they feel good about what they're writing? And that... That's a fantastic question, and I was hoping that you'd ask that <laughs> because okay. I, have a, I, have a, I have a multi step answer. First of all, I think one of the easiest ways would be to write about yourself in the third person. All right, step outside the box for a second and, and stop thinking about. I do this and I do that and I am this and I, you know, I had this experience of, and, and, and take, take a view of yourself from the third person. Okay. Now, again, for those of you, let's, let's, let's just talk about the first person versus third person just for a second. Right. So first person is I walked out the door this morning. I walked my dog. I went down. I went down to the store. Um, I got into an argument with the, with the manager of the hardware store price on the big, I did this, I did that. Then they did this to me. Then, so that's all first person. Now, third person is most of the books that you read. Most of the novels that you read are told in third person. Harry Potter. So we, we have the person's name, right? Harry Potter got up. He got on the train. Harry went to Hogwarts. Harry decided he was going to play Quidditch. Harry, Harry, uh, you know, he, he took a class in spells. It's all about Harry, right? So in my case, my third person version of my of the story would be Richard got up. He did so. I would I would look at myself sort of from the outside as though I'm a different person, right? And what this does is is it allows you to distance yourself a little bit from your from yourself, and it's it's always a little difficult when we're writing about I me. Because you you know you use the word I did this and I did this and I did that and I did this and and it just seems like wow I, ugh, I I don't feel very comfortable putting that much out about me me saying all that right which leads me to my second point which is you need to get used to building yourself up in front of other people now Amy I know. I know she knows what I'm talking about. In fact, she does the same thing in terms of her instruction and classes and, and, uh, and advice in terms of personal branding and putting herself out there. And, you know, I've heard about her stories of being on tour and, uh, you know, getting out of the bus and everyone's representing, uh, you know, the, the, the group and the veterans, et cetera. So it, you should, once you're done with this podcast, don't stop. Go directly to Amy's. Uh, I can I think it's episode 13 of season two. Wow. And listen He's to hired as our PR. So <laughs> and I, it was interesting because I didn't know Amy was actually going to be co-hosting today. And that was one of the episodes that I'd listened to and really, really loved. So anyway, the second thing you need to do is you need to get used to sort of patting yourself on the back and and gushing a little bit about your accomplishments. Now, this is a very, very difficult thing to do, especially if you're a junior or senior in high school or if you're a freshman or sophomore in college. No, we're taught not to brag, not to gush, not to, but what you have to do is you have to find a, a fine line, a balance, because you want to let people know about your accomplishments without seeming like a braggart, right? right? You want to let people know that you can handle a situation. And so that's where storytelling comes in. Because again, one of the things that I do is, is I work with students and as students of all ages, I work with entrepreneurs who are doing startups. I work with people who are lifelong learners and they have companies that are worth, you know, millions of bucks. And they're still working on this same thing. Okay, so this isn't, this isn't just you. It's not just because you're 16, 17, 18 years old and you haven't gotten out in the world yet. This happens to everyone and no one really feels comfortable doing this in the beginning. And so with a story, what you can do, for instance, here's a great example. You're gearing up for an interview, a job interview. 
You want to prepare for that interview and come up with a story or two that really exemplifies you as a leader or you as a responsible citizen or worker or employee. Now you may you may have had a job, maybe maybe you were you know assistant manager at McDonald's. So you go into this interview and the interviewer says, "Are you responsible?" Well, you can answer, "Yes, I am. I'm responsible." Okay, well, you've told them you're responsible. And they say, well, now, are you punctual? Yes, I am. I'm always on time. I was on time to this meeting. They say, fantastic. And they write, you know, they make a note and then they move on. Now, when an interviewer asks you, are you responsible? That's an opportunity for you to pull this story, not literally, but figuratively out of your pocket and say, yes, I am. In fact, I, I work, uh, you know, I work as an assistant manager at McDonald's. And last Friday night after the manager left, we had a French fry fire in the fryer. And I had to call the fire department and call the manager and shut this down. And all of a sudden, are you bragging? No, you're telling a story and you're informing the interviewer through this story both with the content of the story, but also with the way that you tell the story, that you are responsible, that you can think on your feet, that you communicate on the fly. And so what's going to happen? The interviewer, first of all, you've, you've shown and told the interviewer this. So they're going to write down, Guy Richard, French fry fire, right? <laughs> yes. And, uh, and so, the, you know, when, when it comes time that they're looking through their, you know, 100 resumes or 50 resumes or even 20 resumes, and they say, okay, there was that guy with the striped shirt, and there was the guy with the curly red hair, and there was the person with the glasses, and there was French fry fire. You think that they're not going to remember you because of the French fry fire? They're going to immediately be taken back to your story and back to how you communicated that in the interview. Yeah. And so what you need to do is find a nice, quiet place. This is a little challenge for you. Find a nice, quiet place. Maybe it's outdoors, you know, a table in the back of your house, or you, you know, maybe go to a park and take a pad of paper and a pen and write down everything positive, crazy, fun, responsible that you've done in your life. Even if it's tiny, right? Even if you think that it's tiny, write all that stuff down and then read through it and see if it doesn't you know, uh, cue your brain to come up with some other stuff and really just write down everything that you've got and then take another sheet of paper and blow it out of proportion a little bit, right? Expand on it. And, and, and as though you're a third person looking in go, yeah, you know what? That was really an amazing incident when I was, you know, I was a lifeguard at the pool and this kid slipped and fell into the water and I didn't know, I jumped in, you know, right in that. I mean, whatever it is that you've got, you have something that is specific to you and specific to your experience as a human being. So what you want to do is, is capture those ideas and cultivate them and curate them and sit with them. And then as you go through the process of filling out applications, you're starting to think about these essays for colleges and jobs and, and you know, a camp counselor, all, all this kinds of stuff. You're going to remember, oh, yeah, right. I remember now because when you're when you've got the nervousness of being in an interview, you can't you can't be expected to come up with something on the fly. But if you come up with something beforehand, and the, and the interviewer says, like, like the French fry fire story, uh, it seems as though you're telling it off the cuff, right? Mm -hmm. So you want to come up with these ideas. You want to pour through them. You want to let them sift, right? There's a reason that you want to give yourself a week or two or three weeks to do this because things happen. Your brain is working even when you think it's shut down. Even when you're sleeping, you're dreaming about stuff and you're, you know, you're, you're thinking about these possibilities for stories that you can incorporate into these various applications or, or, uh, or, or presentations. And so that would be my basic advice. I mean, I could, I could keep going in terms of the process, but that's a good start that can get you going so that when you get into a situation like the interview, you've got something in your back pocket that you can pull out and impress the interviewer uh, based on your past experience.
Richard, That's you it. just hit that head on because I do require all of my private clients I'd right away say, I want your top three stories. We're going to craft them together and they're mm. going to always be in your tool belt for everything you do. And we go through them together. We craft their stories. So you hit that head on. Also, I think we're all going to be dreaming about French fries tonight just for us. I'd love to segue over to your book because we're going to talk a little bit about the chat GPT and how you've integrated this. And I know it's such a hot topic. If you could share the book and let's start a little bit of a chat on that as well. Well, sure. So, so for those of you who are listening on a podcast, imagine I'm holding a book that says, oops, I'm, I'm, it says chat G. Oh, there it is. Chat GPT simplified. Uh, now let me say something. Um, I am, I am a creator. I'm a storyteller. I am not a programmer. I've worked on some apps. I've worked on some games. I've worked on a lot of TV shows that use a lot of technology. We do special effects, et cetera, but I am not a tech head. So I realized that there's a lot of buzz about AI in general and then chat GPT in specific. And there's a lot of anxiety out there. I know that there are a lot of people who are really, really anxious about chat GPT. Now, some of them are anxious because they're incredibly excited. And they realize the possibilities and they're just anxious to jump on and start working with it. But there's a whole, whole lot of folks out there who are really anxious about this because of the doom and gloom, because it's going to destroy chances to get a job. It's going to it's going to take over the, 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 the robots are going to take over society. So let's just everyone oh, just take a deep breath. <laughs> and then take, take one more one more deep breath. And let's, let's, think, let's think back into the past. Now, the year is 1455. Now, does anyone know what happened around 1455? Amy, Ed? Well, Ed, Ed and I were there, but... Um... Okay. Well, <laughs> wow. Wow. <laughs> you all look great. So in 1455 was about the time of the printing press. Now, prior to the printing press, books were just written by, you know, monks in some abbey by hand, right? And prior to that, all the stories were handed down or passed down by storytellers through the oral tradition. Now, when the printing press was invented and all of a sudden, the, the possibility of reading all those stories in a book came up. Do you think that the oral tradition folks, the folks that were telling all these stories, the keepers of these stories for generations and generations of people, you think they weren't a little bit nervous? You think they weren't shaking in their boots going, okay, there's this new thing, it's called a book and it's gonna take over my job and then I won't have anything to do because no one's gonna listen to my stories, everyone's gonna read the stories. That's exactly what happened. It was exactly the same situation as we have with chat GPT right now. Everyone's freaking out because, you know, people are saying chat GPT is going to take over the world. It's going to, it's, it's going to reduce all our communications to mush. It's, and so I'd like to set the record straight. Chat GPT is simply a tool. It's a tool just like a calculator is a tool for a mathematician. Now, you can't expect a mathematician or a high-level engineer to figure out how to put space a SpaceX rocket into the heavens with a pen and a piece of paper, right? So they need a high-end computer program that can help them with these formulas or a high-end calculator. It's a tool. Now, ChatGPT is a tool very similar to a calculator, but for creators. Now, again, remember, I'm a storyteller. So I'm viewing this new technology through the lenses or the glasses of a storyteller. Now, other people might, might view ChatGPT in, in another way, but for me, ChatGPT is a tool for being more creative. And so to all those people who say, oh, every, all the communication is just going to be mush. Every Twitter post and every blog post is created with a with a prompt it's just going to be bleh. So they're all going to sound the same and you might be right if if amy uses a prompt and then she hands it off to me and i use that same prompt and then i hand it to ed and ed uses that same prompt and he adds it to layla and Layla. well sure if we all write a blog post it doesn't matter what we write a blog post about but 
they're going to be pretty similar and they're going to be a little bit of oatmeal, right? However, if Amy says, oh my gosh, I've got this, 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 uh, this, uh, you know, question and this prompt and hands it to me. And I say, yeah, but you know what? It doesn't have any of my personality in it. So, so I'm going to say, hey, can you respond with a little bit of sense of humor or include some pop culture re uh, uh, results? I'm going to make that prompt my own. So when it spits out the answer, whether I'm doing research or I'm trying to do some content or I'm organizing, brainstorming for a project, I'm going to make that prompt my own. And so I'm going to use ChatGPT to amplify my personal message. Now, let's, let's push ChatGPT aside a second, all right? And think about storytelling in its basic form. What is a story? Well, it's an account. It's an account of something that happened. Stories can be educational, they can be entertainment, they can be persuasive. And so when we tell a story, the more emotional we can get, the more connection we can make, the better. And that comes through our individual experiences and how we use those to tell the story. Now, my dad used to tell jokes, but he also loved, loved to hear his jokes told by one of his friends. So we'd be at a party and, and across the room, my dad would hear Bob Reed, his best friend, starting one of my dad's jokes, right? And my dad would rush over there and sidle up. Now he wouldn't give the punchline away. He would just sit there and listen. He just loved to hear someone else tell one of his jokes because what was the difference? Well, Bob Reed is going to put his own spin on that joke different than my dad would or that I would, right? And so the same thing with any story. Whatever story you tell, and again, if it's a story for an interview or a story for an essay, you want to pack that story full of you, full of the things that make you who you are. And so as you go to the park and you're writing these, these accounts down of the cool things you've done, tap into, well, what are the things that you've done that no one else could have done? What are the things that you've done that only you could do? And so then now we can return to chat GPT. And when we return to this technology, we look at it and we say, okay, this technology, again, it's just a tool. And all it's really going to help you do is amplify your own creativity, your own individualism, your own originality. And so to me, that's the important facet of this new technology is that the coolest thing about ChatGPT for me is that it helps me think outside the box. I love it as a brainstorming tool. It's like having 14 other people, Einstein and, you know, and Henry Ford. And I mean, it's like having all these people in a room with all this knowledge. And when I say, hey, I'm interested in teaching a, a workshop on storytelling and jokes, you know, all of a sudden, you know, I've got uh, I've got uh, Marcho Grau, Gra uh, 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 Marcho Gra Marcho Grauks. Oh my gosh, Groucho Marx in the room with me, responding and offering ideas on how to tell jokes. And so, really, it's a tool that you can use by just simply typing in some questions about what's going on in your life. And and so, if you're interested. You can, uh, you can go on to Amazon, search for ChatGPT Simplified, which is my book. And what I've done is I've, I've taken my approach to ChatGPT, which is really through the eyes of a storyteller. And I've written a book that is written in everyday language. You know, it doesn't have a bunch of per, you know, technology and jargon and everything. It's got lots of fun stories and references to to uh, Harry Potter and Avengers and Batman and all, all sorts of fun pop culture, Pikachu. And, and so what I've done is try to create a book that everyone can read and get excited about using this technology to amplify and emphasize their own creativity. Amazing. I love it. <laughs> I, love it. Here. I feel like you've answered probably like five of my yeah. questions. <laughs> 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 but we answered five, you know? Um, wow. But that's amazing. I'm so impressed by that. And I think that like now AI technologies can be sometimes like intimidating, like you said, or like misunderstood by like non-technical individuals, but also 
looking ahead, I mean, what do you envision about um, the future of AI enhanced storytelling? And are there any emerging trends or developments that excite you? Well, that again, that's a fantastic question, Layla, because I, I imagine creating a, a template that can help students, but not, not, I mean, when I say students, I mean, students of all ages. And of, I mean, they're students of life who would enjoy getting involved with something like this. But so I imagine a platform or a program. And um, I know that there are some that are being developed, but that, that focus the energy back into the technology, right? I think that a lot of folks in education are, they, there's a knee jerk reaction, which is, yeah. Oh my gosh, our students are going to cheat. Right. Well, okay, that I, I understand that, but that's not the only that's not the only issue, right? New York City schools on January fifth, they banned ChatGPT from every device on their campus, from all the computers. It can't be used, which I think is a disservice because those students aren't going to have the chance to use this incredible technology. In fact, let me let me just say that. I interviewed uh, someone as an assistant yesterday and I was blown away. They told an amazing story in their interview and I said, okay, I want to hire you. And I said, the first thing I want you to do tomorrow today um, is uh, I want you to jump on Google. I want you to start researching data for these markets and then put together a spreadsheet. And they said, Ooh, I, I don't know how to use the internet. Huh? What? <laughs> Uh, that's what I said. Now, now I have to say, I just made that up. Okay, that, that's not a real story. <laughs> no my, my mother applied for a job. What? <laughs> yes, exactly. But but hold on. What was what was the reaction from the three of you all? It was no. utter unbelievable. You know, wait, what? The person didn't know how to use the the internet. Well, that's what it's going to be like in, I don't know, five years, three years, two years, six months with chat GPT or AI in general. The students or the, the graduates who have experience with this technology and understand how to integrate it into their workflow, into content creation, into social, you know, into, into whatever facet of the business that you're interested in getting into. If you're not up to speed on how to use this technology, just like right now, if you don't have, know how to use the internet, you don't don't look for a job. I mean, you know, you'll be digging ditches somewhere. Uh, last time I, I I know that you know you don't use the internet to to dig a ditch, right? And so, what you want to do is you want to search that information out that can help you be the the most uh, the most competitive uh, graduate that you can be. And so ultimately. That is is what I'm trying to do is I'm trying, I feel like sometimes I feel like chat GPT and AI enhanced storytelling is the way, right? I feel like I'm going, you know, evangelist going out and, and, and selling this. And, and um, but it's true. And if you think of it just from a storytelling standpoint, I mean, storytelling is really how we communicate the best. It's how we get points across. It's how we get people to remember information as opposed to just strings of numbers. And so AI enhanced storytelling, and that's a, a term that I've actually come up with. So uh, AI enhanced storytelling is I use ChatGPT all the time. Now, sometimes I only, only use it for brainstorming. Sometimes I use it for organizing and outlining. And at other times I use it for basic content creation. Now, have I ever put in a prompt and had the, had the generated uh, answer come back 100%? No. And therein lies what Ed and, and Amy were saying before, the people who can understand how to create these prompts and get the information back and synthesize that information, we still have to be the critical thinkers. Chad GPT is providing us with information, but we have to be the critical thinkers that take that information and decide what is worth presenting to our audience. Mm -hmm. And ultimately that can only be done by a human. So there are, there are limitations with regard to what ChatGPT can do and how it can do it. And so 
in terms of the future, I think that there's going to be a lot more integration of chat GPT and AI into what we do and at a, at, at a more consumer level, as opposed to, you know, the past five, six, eight years, it's really been Netflix is using AI to help us pick better TV shows to watch and Amazon to pick better products. And so AI has been out there, but it just hasn't been out there for the, the, the masses, for the, for the consumers. And now that it is, it's those folks who are, who are taking it and going, wait, I can do some amazing things with this. I mean, let, let, for a second, let's just think about this. Say you're a graphic designer. Okay, let's, let's take a hard, fast example. You're a graphic designer. You've just gotten out with a degree in graphic design and you're hanging up your shingle and you're going freelance. Where are you gonna find business? Well, you could go to some of the freelance sites that are Upwork and Fiverr. You can also go to ChatGPT and say, I'm a brand new freelancer. What can I do to generate business? Mm -hmm. And it's going to come back with a whole plan of things that you can do. And, and if you say, hey, put it into bullet points, it's going to organize it into bullet points. You can say, okay, under bullet point one, I'm going to contact local businesses. Okay, you, you could be doing logos, you could be doing uh, internet uh, graphics for internet marketing, for websites, you can, oh, you could combine your talents with an internet, uh, you know, some sort of a web designer who needs an artist to do graphic design. I mean, all of a sudden, you can type in one sentence to chat GPT. And next thing you know, you've got all these ideas of how to market yourself and how to look for work. And then you say, I'm really not good at networking. What can I do to, to network better as a graphic designer? It can help you think of ways and then you can press it for more information and more information. Okay, what organizations can I join? What, I mean, the, again, the possibilities are infinite and we haven't even gotten to the creative part of it yet. That's just the logistical part of trying to figure out how to market yourself as a brand new graphic designer or web developer or musician, composer. I mean, whatever you do, whatever you're doing, you can use this as an amazing resource that is available and can give you much better answers than just typing uh, a search term into Google or Bing or you know, whatever your or Safari or whatever your favorite search engine is. This is one of the most fascinating conversations we've had. I mean, I love I love all my guests, but I Richard, I love you. Uh, so, <laughs> so listen, you've been very generous with your time. Uh, extraordinary. Uh, we'd love to have you back and kind of dive into this some more. Um, but we got to wrap up this episode. So on behalf of our guest, Richard Rosser, and our co-host, guest co-host, Layla, and of course, Amy and myself, we try to be here as much as possible. This has been a fascinating conversation about AI. And uh, I just wanted to just, Richard, thank you so much for being thank here. Thank you, Richard. Um, oh, and, and I'm going to tell you something right now. There are a lot of people who kind of hit the wall when it comes to creativity. And so this, this, this opportunity in your book is going to be really valuable for some folks. So uh, again, thanks for being here. So if you've enjoyed this episode, give us a thumbs up, a little like action. If you think there's other people who really can appreciate it, and I know there's a lot of them out there, please give it to them so they can. And then subscribe to the channel because we've got plenty of guests like Richard who can give us valuable information on how to move into your career your education. I did that backwards. Your education, your career, and beyond. Thanks again, Richard. Appreciate your time. My pleasure.